What's going on guys, you're here with Nate28 and this is Crossbeats Production. So I want to do a bit of a different video for you guys this time and show you some stuff that you might not realize about EQ and compression. Um, these these techniques and, and things like that, even limiting for example, um, you can see a lot from using this Q clone which I've set up in Logic. I don't usually use Logic too much but I had to use Logic to set this up because Studio One just can't. Uh, actually set up a loop within Studio One because uh, the way it's set up. So um, it was a bit of mucking around to do it in Studio One. I didn't want to mess around with that, so I just did it easily in, in uh, Logic. So basically what I wanted to show you guys was one thing about um, limiting inside of the, um, you know, the electronic, I guess, music side of things. So all of, all of in-the-box equipment uh, basically has has a way of dealing with audio and um, there's a couple of things that I want to show you about one EQ, um, two compression and limiting and the way it affects um, low end and top end frequencies. Now if you guys are familiar with Q Clone, basically what it is, it's a plugin that you set up within your, your DAW of choice. Um, it sends out a, a signal which this um, captures the signal in a sign or some sort of sine wave or whatever it is that it sends out um, and it captures it within the Q clone little plug in here so the good thing about this is uh, with with using hardware if you're using hardware outside of your plugins um, then you can actually see for example if you're using a Poltec EQ you could actually see the kind of curvature that you're getting with the boosts and cuts that you're doing within your plug uh, so your hardware um, the same thing applies with with plugins and the way that plugins act now, there's one thing I've noticed in watching hardware units and plugins and how they deal differently with audio. I mean, for example, this Poltec EQ, um, if you're comparing it to the hardware unit, it doesn't sound exactly the same. And there's a couple of reasons why it doesn't. And I guess there's certain things that you can't do within modeling and, you know, the the replication of plugins that, that you just won't be able to get the exact same sort of sounds out of from the hardware versus the plugin. Um, I didn't want to make this video about debating whether or not plugins and hardware, which one's better. Um, that's not what the purpose of this video is. It's more or less to show you guys, uh, one, looking at a hardware unit. I don't have an example to show you, but just looking at hardware units and um, listening to them and then versus a plugin. So there's plenty of videos on YouTube about these types of things. But um, what I wanted to show you first off was EQ. Um, so... Watching this meter here, I'm going to zoom in on this and I'm just going to show you some examples of the way this Poltec EQ works and give you an idea of how you can use this in a mastering um, setup or a mixing setup for that example. Um, so first off, I'll just use this, I'll ignite this and set, start the process. So let's go with this uh, Poltec EQ and I'll activate the plugin. I'll turn down all the settings I've got here and I'll just show you how it works. So let's just turn that on there. Now, as you can see on this uh, EQ, EQ thing here, when I hit capture, it allows me to see the actual signal coming in and out of that plugin. So, um, as you can tell, there's certain things that are happening already with the volume increase and things like that. So, if I turn this off, it um, it obviously has some sort of volume increase because of the way it's uh, processing audio through the plugin. So, first off, you can see here down at this um, this level meter here, it's minus 16. If I turn that on it goes up to minus 14. So right there you're getting an increase of uh, 2 dB of gain just by turning the plug-in on. There's been no activation of any of these boost cuts or anything like that, attenuation or anything like that. So you can see that it gives you a, a bit of a gain um, frequency wise in that in that regard. So look out for that. You know in plugins sometimes you might get gain without even doing anything. That's one thing to pay attention to. Um, the other thing is uh, with with the actual plugin itself, it may not work the same way the hardware actually did uh, due to the limitations of electronic um, components and things like that. Uh, so let's just boost the uh, the low end frequencies and see what we get. So I'll boost at 20, which is the frequency this is set to right now, and I'll boost that and I'll, sh I'll just see what I get. So we'll just go to excessive just so I can show you how, how high it goes up there. So, okay, so we're getting about roughly 12, somewhere like that, 12 dB of increase at the 20, 
20 hertz frequency. So let's just move this up to 30 and see where it goes. So as you can see, it hasn't really dipped down or anything like that. It's kept increasing the real low end stuff, but it's just moved it up further up the spectrum. Let's go to 60. Okay, so 60, it's boosted it quite significantly, and that, that just keeps pushing that further and further up. Now, let's move it to 100 and see what we get there. Okay, so it's pretty much just moving it up the spectrum, as you can see there. So I'll just move it back to 60, and I'll move this down to about 4, 4 dB gain, roughly. To show me the kind of curve that I'm getting. Okay, so if you're looking at the curve now, it's it's like a shelf basically, from what I can see there, and it's basically boosting it at about kind of in the middle of 60, pushing it up to 100k almost. Um, but it's not exactly at 60. So from my understanding, the actual Poltec EQ, and if I had one to show you, I could I could explain it. But from my understanding, the curves, if you're going to do this um, in that kind of fashion. You would more or less get curves of this nature, which I'll just show you an EQ. Just turn this EQ on here. Now, like I said, it's not about a comparison of what's better and that sort of thing, but I just wanted to show you that um, different different EQs provide different curves. So, as you can see here, I've got a, a high pass filter which allows me to high pass uh, filter all of the frequencies above, uh, b sorry, below that. Um, so, if you're looking at a real Poltec EQ, you'd probably get a curvature. Something more like that. That's what I would assume you'd probably get. Less of a shelf, but more of a boost in the in the low end 60k kind of frequencies there. Um, and it's not necessarily always a bad thing the way that these plugins work, but you know it it definitely shows you that not all of the plugins actually replicate the hardware units, and there are differences in the plugins versus hardware units. Anyway, so let's just use another EQ for an example just before I switch to um, compressors and show you how I've uh, discovered certain things in these compressors. So let's let's set this one. This is a, um, a Neve filter, and it basically um, has an interesting way of filtering things. So it curves like this. So basically, like I was saying in another video that I've done, that it actually has a, a filter that's like a scale, I guess. If you look at that, if you're moving the filter... It's kind of like a scale. So if you've got the heavy stuff on this end, obviously that's dipping it down. So low end frequencies, it's dipping that because I'm boosting the high. And if I'm boosting the low, vice versa happens and it boosts the low and cuts the high. So if you're looking at a filter like that, that's kind of what that does. And the reason why I'm showing you this type of filter is because in a mastering plugin that I quite frequently use and I show you on my channel a lot, um, I'll just show you that before I go to the other part of um, compressors. Uh, where are we? Okay, so uh, the mastering compressor that I use quite frequently is this one here. And this is a really great compressor for mastering. Um, once again, hardware units. I, I just, I, I haven't heard anything that sounds so good like the hardware unit of this actual plugin. But anyway, that's not what we're here it's for. Um, so. <laughs> So I'll show you this. So this is that filter that I was showing you before. Like I said, it kind of tilts just like you saw on the other one. And that's what that filter does there. So it allows you within mastering, if you're using this compressor, it allows you to filter some of the low end frequencies, it allows you to then increase the top end or vice versa. Some of the, the low end, it boosts that and increase, sorry, decrease the top end stuff. So that's that filter there. And um, the other thing I just wanted to show you here is the warm function. So if I just turn that on, you can see here right away, it dips out some of that, that real top end stuff. So just pay attention to that. So that's, that's basically all of that, that top end, real high end stuff that it gets rid of. And they call that the warm function. Now, if you pay attention to why they call that the warm function, it's pretty much, I would assume, because in the days of vinyl or even in tape, and I'm going to show you this as an example as well. Um, in those days, you know, you would have had to roll off some of the top end stuff. And also you would have had to roll off some of the bottom end, bottom end stuff. So you'd probably get something that um, more or less kind of looks a bit like that, but even less, less bottom end and definitely less top end. Uh, so they would have had something that rolls off all of that, that top end stuff to get rid of the real high end stuff. That's a mosquito there. Um, and it would have allowed the 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 vinyl to be written correctly, and there wouldn't have been any errors when they're using the the vinyl and the lathe. 
Um, so that's one thing you just keep in mind. So when, you, when you're getting a tape that sounds warm or a record that sounds warm, you know why, because most of the high-end stuff is controlled, most of the low-end stuff is controlled, and it's more or less the mid-frequencies that they're paying attention to a lot. So that's one thing I want to show you with this, and the other thing I want to show you with compressors is a little feature that I picked up just noticing using this Q clone, and that's um, using compressor in general. So if I just boost this all the way so it attenuates. Now... Look at the curvature that you're getting just from attenuation on a standard compressor without changing any of the release or attack settings. Now it's getting about minus 4 dB of compression and it just shows you that it gets a curvature where it removes some of that top end frequency and allows some of the low end stuff in. And that's just at the attack setting that it's on. So this gives you an indication when you're using compressors, for example, this is at a 26 millisecond attack and this is at a, a 338 or three yeah 338 millisecond release so if you're looking at that and you think okay i want some of my low end to be more blended with the top end frequencies and i want it to be more of a compressed sort of smooth signal what would you think that's required in that situation well if you're looking at a compressor you basically can move your needle to one of two ways so you can move it back so it's a faster release or you can move it forward so it's a slower release now, as you can see, when I moved it forward to a slower release, it evened the signal out. Now, that's a good thing to know because if you're looking at, say, for example, low-end frequencies in your mix and you're looking at a, a low-end frequency in the sense of um, how long you want it to hold, if it's an 808, for example, or if you want to think of it in the sense of low-end frequencies in general, um, generally, low-end frequencies are something that is felt and not generally heard as much. Um, especially when you're looking at sub sub uh, or subharmonic frequencies, they're more or less felt and not heard. And generally, you're looking at those frequencies in the sense of making them be felt in the the uh, the chest and things like that. Um, so, if you were um, mastering your track or you're EQing your track and you're trying to figure out what kind of compression that you want to use after the EQ or prior to the EQ, um, you can analyze something of this nature and just just think about what I've shown you here and look at the settings that you've got on your compressor. So if you want a fast um, release, obviously you're going to get a lot of that low end frequency still in the the um, the mix there. And some of the top end will be sort of dipped down. But if you want a, a, a longer release, that'll kind of create more of an even signal and it will extend, for example, the, the reverb tail on a snare or it'll extend the actual length of the kick. Um, blending the kick in for a longer period of time so that's something just as a key to pay attention to you know if you're just reducing the volume obviously that's the the ratio there that doesn't really change too much of the curvature of that eq there but it does show you that there is some effect using different attack and release settings um, on the low end and the top end frequencies so if i, I use a really slow uh, attack it's basically just allowing it to blend, but it is cutting some of the top end frequencies off and some of the lot lower sort of frequencies. And then if I just change this as a fast uh, type of release, then it's more or less just leaving the signal kind of as it is. So if you've got a fast uh, release and a slow attack, uh, then you're going to get some sort of signal like this. And if you increase your attack setting, then that's when you're really starting to play with the, the low end frequencies and the top end frequencies of your mix. So that's something to pay attention to, something to take a note of. Just remember um, when you're using compression that these attack and release settings do affect the way your low end comes through um, and it does affect the way your top end comes through as well. So that's one thing I want to show you as well. Now, the next thing I want to show you guys before I close this video off is using limiters. Now, a lot of people think that, you know, if you just slam a limiter, um, there's some things that happen as far as loudness and... You know, everybody's chasing that loudness kind of thing, and that's the loudness war within, I guess, music in general. Uh, but the thing I want to show you, though, is with this limiter in, sen in the sense of how limiters work, and um, especially, you know, when, you when you're pushing a limiter, the kind of distortion that you're going to get as well. So this, this limiter is an IRC 1, 2, and 3. Now, IRC 2 is mainly the limiter that um, you'd see in a Waves IRC 1 as well, and 3. 
Um, this IRC4 is more of a modern sort of limiter. That's um, that's an ozone seven sort of you know calculation that they've got there. Um, but let me just play the signal through um, without this this plugin on. I'll just turn that off, and we'll just put um, the the limiter on, and let's just see what that does. So let me just activate that, and let's see what IRC1 does. So obviously it's boosting the signal in general. I'll just turn this down a bit so it doesn't um, doesn't go too high. But let's just say we got minus 12. Okay, so as you can see, the curvature on this, and we're getting some reduction at about minus three roughly, okay? So we've got some interesting things happening here. So if I just um, turn this on and off and just show you what happens here. So I'll just turn that off. So mostly the signal is kind of left alone. It doesn't really change too much, but it does boost some of the low end stuff that's happening. Um, and it creates a bit of a curve there and also creates some somewhat of a bit of distortion up within the top end frequencies there as well. If you just turn it off, you can still see there's a little bit of distortion that's already added by that, that curvature, so don't pay too much attention to that. But what you're going to find interesting, though, is when you move down these limiters, so say, for example, using IRC2 as a limiter, let's see what happens there. Okay, we're getting a lot of distortion that's starting to appear in the top end frequencies of the track and also down in the bottom end frequencies. So let's just move to IRC3. All right, so this is where it gets really interesting. So Throughout the entire signal, I haven't changed anything to do with the threshold. All I've done is change the type of limiter that I'm using. But if you pay attention to this, you're seeing a load of distortion within the IRC3 limiter. And that just tells you that this limiter has a different way of dealing with the actual signal that it's receiving. And if it's pushed fairly hard, it's going to distort. And that's something that you want to pay attention to when you're using a limiter especially when you're using in the, the audio digital realm as far as in the box. Um, if I push this IRC4, um, as you can see, it's less distortion. So it just goes to show you they've got different algorithms behind the scene that create um, the pathways for these limiters to work. And when you start to see that they're actually causing a limiter effects, so when it's compressing and limiting and raising the volume, um, it creates distortion. So what you'd want to do in that regard is if you're using limiters, try to realize that, you know, when you've got a limiter that's being pushed as hard as it possibly can. So you can see here it's quite flat. There's no distortion. But as soon as you start to push that thing, you start to get distortion. So that's what you've got to really pay attention to and be aware of because, you know, when you're pushing it really hard, this is the kind of distortion that you're going to get. And that's at minus five. Uh, I wouldn't really recommend using any limiter to that amount, especially in the audio uh, digital realm. Uh, even with this RC1, you know, it's not distorting anywhere near like the RC3 was. Um, but this IRC2 definitely starts to distort. Whether or, not, whether or not that distortion is good, bad, I guess that's for you to determine. And it's also for your source of audio that you're working on. Um, but, you know, you've you got to realize that these types of things, they, they have limitations. And um, when it comes down to it, you're going to start to realize that you can only push them so far without hearing uh, negative effects of those things. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little kind of tutorial about, you know, different audio uh, scenarios, for example, EQ, compression, and limiting. Um, and I hope you guys uh, got something out of it because, you know, if there's, if there's something you can learn from it is that working on audio, it's definitely something different outside of, um, you know, outside of the box if you're using external hardware and things like that. Obviously, there's things that you've got to worry about then in that sense. Um, but if you're working in the box, which a lot of people are these days, uh, they're working within a computer and they use a lot of uh, plugins and things, things like that. Um, you know, this, this kind of plugin will help you see the kind of things that you're actually facing before you actually face them. So it's a good way to prepare yourself mentally and to know in advance when you're using compressors, when you're using limiters and things like that, how far you can drive them before they're going to start to distort or create issues in your mix. Um, so anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if there's anything in the comments, let me know. And otherwise, let me know in the comments if there's anything else you want to see on this channel. Love you guys and peace.